Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome back to Scared to Death, Creeps and Peepers. I'm Dan. Hi, I'm Lindsay. Thanks for listening, or thanks for watching us on YouTube. Watching. No. I didn't watch that opening today. I am no, already... you closed your eyes. Yeah, I'm already freaked out. I, I was envisioning a... Um, what you do is you think about mm -hmm. a white light or a golden light all around you protecting you. Uh -huh. And that... It's all about intent. Okay. And so... Oh, I, I just stabbed myself with my amulet that's on underneath my dress. <laughs> While you were thinking about that, I was thinking about demons. I like wanted a break. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we appreciate all the ratings as well. Thanks for continuing to give those. It helps us stay in the charts, helps yes. us find new creeps and peepers. Yes, you guys are the best. Thank you, thank you, thank you. New subscribers uh, to, uh, you know, uh, Bad Magic Productions on YouTube. So that's been fantastic. Super awesome. We're, we're proud of the, the video quality that uh, producer Joe puts out every week. I know. Joe's the best. And we get a lot of compliments on that. So mm, thank you do. guys so much. And uh, it was fun to meet some uh, creeps and peepers in Grand Rapids this past weekend. Yes, I had my first like intimate moments with some fans of just yeah. like oh my god I love it so much how are you are you okay like all the things mm -hmm. it was amazing so thank you thank you for my presence <laughs> we we were there for some uh, I had some stand up shows and uh, had a live uh, time suck podcast and then you know some scared to death fans there's a lot of crossover yes also came to that show and just you know unprompted even like yelled out love scared to death and that was really cool so yeah. appreciated very much Thank you. And appreciate all the stories uh, sent into my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Last week's story, I think, was scarier than 80% of the stories I presented. Yeah, we like, got... that really freaked me out. Yeah, we got a lot of emails about that. People had a lot of questions about, like, oh, my God, did it happen? Um, you know, we've mm -hmm. opted to keep the name... Um, what's the word I want? Anonymous. Right? Anonymous, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so... People were like, oh, my God, did you research it? Is he really in jail? Like, it's for real, as as real as any other story that we present here. Yeah, and that's all these stories is, uh, you know, somebody's firsthand accounts, sometimes multiple accounts, multiple eyewitness accounts. Sure. But, well, uh, that, well, that woman and her kids, I mean, that's multiple eyewitnesses as far as I'm concerned. Right. That's what we heard. So, eek. Eek. So, keep sending those in to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. And for all the other things, if you have something that you want to tell us, uh, you know, if you want to send us a nice compliment, yeah. which happens, yeah. uh, you can send all of that to me directly at info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. That's where you can reach me mm -hmm. directly. Otherwise, our fantastic helper, Heather, will get back to you about your stories so that I stay sane. <laughs> you can follow us on Instagram at scaredtodeathpodcast uh, and on Facebook. Same handle. All the places. And I'll be, I'll be telling two supposedly true tales as always today. Do my best not to be uh, overly critical of them. I wasn't there, so maybe, maybe one or both of these stories are true, and that is terrifying because both of today's stories I feel like are very scary. Oh, great. I'm already feeling tense because I was thinking about the stories I'm going to tell you. Fun. And it's got my shoulders up in my ears. Uh, revisiting the Black Eyed Children again this week, your, oh, your favorites. Fuck me! Going back. No, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> I'm not allowed to move my chair, otherwise I'd roll back, but... <laughs> Going back to New York City in 1985, one couple's encounter outside of a restaurant that haunts them to this day. No way. You know, that's the thing, too. Like, uh, when we're the few fans that we've seen so far, just, you know, we just got mm -hmm. going on this. They talk about the Black Eyed Children and how it freaks them out. And yeah. I can't. Like, I just cannot. So I'm super pissed at you right now. Well, get ready to get more freaked out. I think this Black Eyed Children encounter is scarier than the first one we did. Awesome. And that's our first tale. Great. In our, in our second story, we go even further back to the early 1900s, heading to a small town in Wisconsin to explore a tale of one woman's demonic possession that supposedly lasted for roughly 30 years. Great. I also hate those as well because, again, having been raised Catholic, demonic possession feels mm -hmm. like a very possible thing to me. This is a super Catholic one. Look the second I'm so, story. I'm already scared. You got, you got your, getting your blanket <laughs> on right now. I got my fuzzy socks on. I can't show you because I'm wearing a dress and I don't want to hoo-hoo the camera. Are you uh, are you ready to get started? No, but am I ever? No, nope, you're not. Okay, I'm okay. Okay, so before we go into this first, a little I'm just recap. Get my crystals. You get your crystals and my cross. 
Get your cross. Get protected. A uh, little recap uh, about Lindsay's favorite monsters, the Black Eyed Children. Oh, my God. Wait, can I tell you really quick? I know sure. we try to get right into it. There's somebody that follows me on Instagram mm-hmm. that is, uh, I can't remember their handle name, but something to the effect of Black Eyed Children. Oh, wow. And it's a creepy, creepy picture of a black eyed child. Yeah. And they make the creepiest comments like, Ooh. don't you think we're oh. real? Oh, yeah. I have seen Do you know that. who that is? I don't know who that oh, is. I don't know who it is. Whoever you are, you're scaring the <laughs> shit out of me. <laughs> I'm sure that'll get them to stop. I'm sure, oh. I'm sure they won't double oh, yeah, up their comments now. Oh, yeah, of course. They'll be like, oh, poor thing. <laughs> I'm screwed. The Black Eyed Children are paranormal creatures or demons or aliens uh, or I guess some combination of all of the above, perhaps even cryptids. Some think they're vampiric in nature, and they typically resemble human children around the ages of 6 to 16. They almost always have pale skin. They always have pitch black eyes. And they give whoever they encounter, they seem to kind of show up out of nowhere, a powerful and palpable feeling of dread, anxiety, good old-fashioned fear. The black-eyed children generally, but far from always, are spotted at night. They typically show up in pairs. They speak in a way that makes them come across as something pretending to be a human child or human teen instead of an actually young human. They don't seem to speak in the lingo that kids speak in at the time. Uh, they usually show up asking to be invited into somebody's home or vehicle. Uh, no way. Why do they need to be invited? No one knows. No names were attached to the following Black Eyed Children Encounter story, so I have assigned the name of Wendy for the woman and Mike for the man for narrative purposes. You Wendy, ready? Wendy and Mike. Wendy oh, okay. and Mike. I'm glad because I don't know any Wendy's. Here we go. Time now for a tale I'm calling What Do They Want? One night, early in the winter of 1985... A young woman, Wendy, was on a date with her then-fiancé and now-husband Mike in Manhattan. The two lifelong New Yorkers, an accountant and a schoolteacher, went out to eat frequently, and they'd been to this restaurant in particular numerous times before. And nothing out of the ordinary ever happened until this night. This night, they had just pulled over shortly after the sun had gone down. They were parking around the corner from the restaurant when they both suddenly heard someone knock their knuckles against the car's front driver's side window. Already not happy. Mike finished putting the car in park. They both looked back and saw two teenage boys in hoods standing outside on the sidewalk. They didn't necessarily look scary, but Wendy immediately felt a fear unlike anything she had ever felt before. Her hands started to shake, something she had never experienced before. The fear felt instinctual, a primal level of fear. She was petrified and she didn't know why. Mike and Wendy both noticed that the two boys looked especially pale. Wendy thought they looked stoned, Why was she freaked out by the sight of two skinny stone teenage boys? She told Mike she wanted to leave, but he wasn't about to let two creepy kids ruin the dinner he'd been looking forward to all day at one of his favorite places to eat. God damn it, Mike. Mike opened the car door, and the two boys stood back to let him out. He'd planned on just ignoring them, walking into the restaurant. Wendy did her best to compose herself, told herself she was just being silly, opened the door on her side of the car, and got out to follow him. Oh, Wendy. When she turned around, she looked at the two boys, and in the dim streetlight, they looked as though they had nothing but black pools where their eyes should be. Just two large patches of black, no other color at all. She'd never seen eyes like that before. There was something almost hypnotic about them. She didn't want to look into their eyes, but she also had a hard time looking away. Her hands, which had just stopped shaking, began to shake all over again. We need a ride in your car, one of them said to Mike. Mike had turned his back to them while he was locking the car door. He hadn't seen their black, shiny eyes yet. Well, he replied, you're shit out of luck. (laughs) One of the strange, pale, dark-eyed boys kept talking as if he had not heard Mike's rude response. He said, it won't take long. We're just young people who need a ride. Get the fuck out of here. Referring to themselves as young people bothered Wendy. She grew even more nervous. What teenagers called themselves young people? It felt like two old men had jumped into these teenage bodies. There was something wrong with them. Something very wrong with all of this. Mm -hmm. Her husband, Mike, a big man and a hardened, ball-busting New Yorker, said, uh, you know, to the uh, two kids who he was now facing after having locked his door, well, shit, sounds like you better take the subway. He still hadn't noticed their eyes. Mike then started to walk towards the back of the car where Wendy stood so they could walk together towards the restaurant. As he walked past the two entities, they suddenly started to scream, Invite us into your car! We can't enter unless you invite us! 
Mike turned back and was about to get into one of these things' faces when he saw their eyes and froze in his tracks. Any thought of a confrontation of any type quickly left his mind. The color immediately left his face. Wendy had never seen Mike react like this before. He was not normally afraid of verbal or even physical confrontation, but this was not normal. This scared him. Mike sidestepped away from the two black-eyed children and moved towards Wendy. The frightened pair moved to the back street side of the car, putting the vehicle in between them and these things. They both watched as the two boys continued to scream and shout, You need to let us in! One of them yelled, pointing directly at them, trying to command them. We have to see our friend! Mike and Wendy now quickly headed towards the restaurant, backing away so they could keep the two black-eyed teens in their sights. They then turned around the corner of the building, nervously walked another 50 or so feet to the restaurant's entrance, and asked the doorman if he'd heard the two boys yelling. The doorman was totally confused. He hadn't seen or heard the boys that had just confronted Mike and Wendy, even though this had all taken place only about 100 feet away. Oh, shit. Mike and Wendy didn't know what to do. They, didn't, they did know they were not ready to walk back around the corner and see if those things were still there. So they decided to have dinner, some drinks. They both thought, hoped, this would be the end of it. When they left the restaurant, Wendy asked Mike to walk ahead of her when they left and check the car. Make sure those things weren't anywhere near it and there was no sign of them anywhere. Wendy was left completely terrified for days afterwards. She didn't sleep very well. She had lots of nightmares, lots of headaches. A week later, she began to dread even going to bed. It seemed like every time she closed her eyes, she would see those two black-eyed children. I know the feeling, Wendy. Every time she opened her eyes, she was worried they'd visit her and Mike again. What if they appeared outside their front door? What if they appeared in their bedroom? Ugh. Wendy was scared to leave the house. She felt violated, as though those things had attacked her. Yet they really hadn't done much other than scream, shout, and act, well, weird. But still, the encounter haunted her. Nightmares, panic attacks, sleepwalking, headaches, fear of seeing them all over again. All in all, it lasted for a few months. And then right when things were starting to calm down, she asked Mike how he was handling what they'd seen. They hadn't discussed it since a few days after it had happened. Mike didn't want to talk about it. Mike now confessed that he'd been keeping something from her. Oh my God. He said he'd seen them again. <gasps> he hadn't wanted to tell her because of how scared she was already. Shit. Mike said a few weeks after the restaurant incident, those same two pale black-eyed teens had shown up outside his office one afternoon. Again, they waited by his car. They did the same thing they'd done outside the restaurant, demanding to be taken somewhere, demanding to be led inside his vehicle. When Mike told them he was calling the police from his office, the kids didn't seem to care. They yelled at him and again demanded that he take them to a specific address, to a home in a suburb in New Jersey, to visit their friend, who they said could help them. Mike went back inside his office building to call the police. Right before he got a hold of an officer, he peeked out a window and saw that they just vanished. When Mike told Wendy all of this, she wrote down the address the black-eyed children had told him, intending to go check it out. Why did they want to be taken there? What was so important about this address? But she never did check it out. They were busy. Pretty soon, it didn't seem to matter. Then the years went by, and she thought about it less and less and less. Pretty soon, a few decades had gone by, and then Mike and Wendy stopped thinking about the black-eyed children altogether. And then just a few years ago, after they finally both retired, they decided to move out of the city, and they bought a home a short train ride away. While moving in, Wendy came across an old box full of keepsakes from years past, and in this box, she found a little scrap of paper with an address on it. <gasps> it was the address the black-eyed children had yelled at Mike. Ooh. And when she looked at it, chills ran down her spine. She screamed for Mike to come look at it. When he saw it, his face went white. It was the address of the home they had just moved into. <gasps> Mike and Wendy live in this house to this day, and every day they worry about seeing the black-eyed children again. Every time the motion detector light goes off in the driveway, Wendy expects to hear a knock at the door, afraid that when she looks out, those two boys will be right there, staring at her with their soulless black eyes, demanding that she let them in. And that's it. So the piece of paper was the address, like... That address that they yelled in that parking lot, the, the, the address that they, they demanded to be taken to, those like 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 thirty over thirty years ago. That's the house they moved into. Is the house they ended up moving into? Fucking sell that house. That's a massive GTFO. <laughs> right. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And Come on. usually, usually I don't on those. I'm like, no, nah, there's rationale. I'm like, nope. nope. If, if I and <laughs> if I find something like that, 
absolutely moving out, putting it up for sale. We can take the loss apartment rather than just wait night after night in complete fear that those little sons of bitches would show back up. Oh, you're mad at them. Those little oh sons my God. of bitches. Uh, okay. So for people who haven't seen on the YouTube, let's get oh, some pictures of man. these things. I really don't want to do this. I know. First picture of a black eyed uh, kid. <laughs> <laughs> that is a black eye. That's a in kid fact. with a black eye. In fact. Uh, next picture of a black eyed kid. Now that that's a guy that came up when I was looking at a homemade eye patch. I just thought it was hilarious. <laughs> it is hilarious. I like the funny ones. Let's get another one up there. Another black eyed kid. Uh, oh, that's oh, the real ones. Oh, oh. that's the ones that are supposedly real. Oh yeah. Yeah, creepy, right? Oh, so my God. creepy. Creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Bitch. <laughs> that was that was from Joe to you. Thank you, Joe. Oh, fun. you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man but that uh yeah the, that that story when i read about it it was the ending that really got me it was the ending right. that really g- gave me the chills uh, yeah in my mind i just keep i'm like it can't be real it can't be real it can't be real like i just right. <sighs> not, maybe it's not maybe it's not maybe it is i don't know i'm still always afraid that they're gonna show up at my house right oh, my i mean gosh. have you ever seen black eyed children no how mad would you be if when you I were, know where you're going. Where am I going? You're going to send somebody with bl- uh, black eyes to like visit me on the road or something. Yeah. I know. Um, I think about that too. What a great what practical if, joke. What, what if you just got a... Oh at your, my God. In a weird hour. Yeah. At, at your that's hotel a, door. I, that's a I joke I'm afraid like, to do because of like the person getting shot. That's a joke where it's well, like... Do you have a gun in a hotel room? Well, no, I don't. <laughs> okay, So I guess then. in a hotel... That's true. In a hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> pew, pew. Pew, pew. Maybe a handgun. <laughs> just, like a literal handgun. Like my hand is as a gun. Oh my god! Eek! I Eek! Just, I what I worry about is you being so mad at me for ruining your sleep. <laughs> <laughs> it depends if if it was done really well. It's like I I think I would actually laugh after the initial scare and appreciate the effort that went into like that level of prank. Right. I mean, I don't know who I would get to do it because they'd have to like paint their face a very very pale white, right? Black contacts. We'd need like an eighteen twenty five costume, right? So, it, and I it'd love take you. a lot of work. Yeah, I'm not going that far for you. Yeah, that's that's a lot. That's a lot. Now, did, did that story? <sighs> You know, the last story, the last time we told the Black Eyed Children's story, the only other time, I don't think you got, I mean, you got scared in the room a little bit, but it was later mm-hmm. that it hit you. Mm-hmm. I wonder how this one will hit you compared to the first one. Oh, well, I was just thinking about, this is Thanksgiving week, and we're headed to oh, yeah. To, oh, Dan, yeah. to Dan's mom's house, which is the middle of fucking nowhere, Idaho. Yeah, like, middle I of nowhere. mean, literally oh, the middle of nowhere. It's like their house sits up on this sort of like ridge, if you will, and it's just oh. surrounded by open nothingness there's there's not a neighbor around for miles my mom would hate this story oh yeah hate it because then she'd be she'd be waiting for him because if if, if the black eyed children came to my mom's house oh you're, you're screwed if the there's, there's no one else around to see to help nothing if the black eyed children come to your mom's house they are fucking real because it's not like um there's no reason for random kids to be walking right by ever. right like it's, it's not a place well it's a huge piece of private property you'd have to walk like half a mile down a private driveway up this hill to get to where you could even go like there's no reason for random uh, people to ever solicitors to ever show up at my mom's door ever no now i'm just envisioning like hearing like someone walk across the cattle grate oh my god and then the second cattle grate it's gonna be a spooky thanksgiving happy thanksgiving by the way and this little in-between stories. I forgot to mention that. Thanksgiving, just a couple of days. So happy Thanksgiving to all our creeps and peepers. I just want, I'd want to forget later. I, I was just going to say, I hope that the trip to Van knocks me out. <laughs> <laughs> I eat so much turkey. I just... <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I, I... Ready for more fear? <sighs> that, was, that, was, that was the warm-up. I, I was just thinking right now, I'm so glad that the there's not windows in this studio. Mm. Because I was just imagining like little black guys. Ooh. Well, we could we could cleanse the palate uh, of black eyed children and replace it with demonic possession. Hold on. Would that help? I got my cross. I got my crystals. Do you think if I like, I got the things? I don't think those things help, but that's that's just me. I, 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 I think it does help. I do think it helps because if you saw my Instagram late last night, mm-hmm. I was very terrified. I know because you kept waking me up. I didn't wake you up once. Yeah, you did. No, I didn't. Yeah. You, well, you wanted me to stay awake by you, which I, I was fine with. But then when you went downstairs, you were doing that thing of like, hey, are you, are you asleep? And I was kind of asleep. But then I, I would wake up. I, I thought it was because you were scared I, and you didn't want uh, me to be asleep when you were awake. That is true. But also, go. I didn't keep waking you up. I came in once because I heard your sleep music going, but I heard talking and I was like, is he still watching a TV show? Like, oh. what's going on? And I came in, I was like, 
hey, mm-hmm. are you up? And you were like, yeah, kind of. Mm-hmm. Okay, I thought it was because you were scared. Well, yes, it was because I was scared, but I didn't keep waking you up. I woke you up once. All right, exaggerated. Exactly. <laughs> You're the worst. Making All right. me look like a fucking weenie. Well, kind of. Well, not that bad. Not that bad. Not okay. that bad. Okay. Remind me after the story, I have to tell you something so creepy that happened with my cell phone today. I just remembered right now. Okay. I'm trying to block it out. Okay, here we go. Uh, we headed the dawn of the 20th century to the rural hamlet of Germantown, Wisconsin for this one. Today, Germantown is a 20,000 person outer suburb of Milwaukee, uh, just over 20 miles northeast of downtown. Back in the early days of the 1900s, it was a 200 person agricultural community of mostly European immigrants. And one of these immigrants uh, was 26 year old Emma H. Schmidt, small, brown eyed, plain looking, introverted, devoutly religious woman described as having a ruddy complexion, who was born in Switzerland shortly before her Catholic parents, Jacob and Anna, German farmers, immigrated to the United States. Her family wasn't able to afford a farm of their own when they first arrived in Wisconsin, and young Emma had to work in some small factories in various small Wisconsin towns back in the days when almost everyone had to work. Emma was deeply religious, and the religious mockery she heard from other workers bothered her greatly. By the time she was a teen, her parents had left the Catholic Church themselves. Uh, Shortly after that, her mother had died, and she frequently argued with her father and brothers— about their, you know, hedonistic lifestyles or non-religious lifestyles. She's very religious, very pious. Then there were rumors that her father began to abuse her, at least physically, perhaps even sexually. Her father also rumored to, to have had an affair with her aunt, Minnie, a woman locals believed to be some sort of witch, actually. It was well known in Germantown that J- Emma herself, again, was deeply religious. Her faith was more important to her than anything else. The church was her safe space, if you will, her sanctuary, a place where she could escape her father's abuse and vision a better life for herself. Sometimes she'd attend both afternoon and evening services on the same day. She was so committed to the church that she began to dream of becoming a nun. She even turned down a local love interest marriage proposal, which was not a common thing to do in the area at the time. And then seemingly out of nowhere, Emma in her mid-twenties suddenly underwent a dramatic personality change. Time now for the tale of the exorcism of Emma Schmidt. Emma suddenly despises the one thing she had always loved, her religion. Notes from her local parish's priest state that Emma suddenly began to fall into strange trances where she would become animalistic, speak in feral grunts. She would also speak in strange voices and uh, what sounded like other languages. She'd suddenly destroy religious objects, vessels of holy water, smash crucifixes. She even confessed to wanting to strangle her priest. The previously especially modest and even puritanical young woman also began to commit what has been described as unspeakable sexual acts. Word reached a bishop in Des Moines, Iowa, Thomas Drum, concerning Emma's possible possession, and he contacted a 39-year-old Bavarian-born priest and demonic specialist. Theophilus Xavier Reisinger, better known as Father Theo, a priest based in Marathon, Wisconsin, 165 miles north of Germantown. Father Theo had previously performed many exorcisms when he had worked in New York City. The church had actually removed him from New York because of these exorcisms. He'd failed to have, uh, you know, enough witnesses verify what he had seen. There was a speculation that he may be making it up. Certain higher-ups in the church wondered if it was actually possessions and not wanting to be embarrassed by some kind of bad publicity surrounding his exorcism. They'd essentially banished him to rural Wisconsin. However, others in the church did believe in Father Theo, believed he was a talented exorcist, and one of those believers was Bishop Drum. Father Theo traveled to Germantown at Drum's behest and followed the Roman ritual the church-mandated process designed to differentiate possession from illness or fraud. I am not so easily convinced that there is a possession, Father Theo had once explained to a reporter in the Milwaukee Journal in a rare interview. Hundreds of persons have been sent to me by priests and laymen who believe that there is a possession. Usually, I find otherwise. Father Theo could immediately tell that Emma was not someone who was going to fall into the otherwise category. He didn't think illness, mental or otherwise, was behind her recent behavioral changes. He thought demonic forces were responsible. When he began the Roman ritual, Emma spoke in voices that didn't belong to her. Voices that didn't seem as if they could possibly come from within her. Some of the voices coming out of Emma spoke in English and German, the languages she spoke. But Father Theo and other attendants present also documented that other voices, and there were so many different, distinct, disturbing voices 
understood and spoke Italian, Polish, Latin, Hebrew. Emma couldn't possibly understand these additional languages. Her formal education had stopped early in elementary school. She had no access to anyone else who spoke all these languages back in Germantown. She had never, to anyone's knowledge, studied or exhibited any knowledge of knowing these languages prior to this recent possession. And it wouldn't be just voices alone that would convince Father Theo that Emma was possessed. During the ritual, Emma was witnessed by everyone present to actually levitate up into the oh air, God. fly across the room, slam into a wall, and then fall to the floor where she seemed pinned down by unseen forces. Four priests, all working together, were unable to lift the petite, five foot seven inch woman, just 135 pounds, off of the floor. She was unmovable, impossibly heavy. Unnatural weight has long been associated with demonic possession. It's as if the evil spirits actually possess measurable, physical presence. The priests observed other chilling physical changes. Priest records describe something I had never heard of prior to this story. Those present said that Emma's abdomen would either move up or down with terrific rapidity beyond the power of a human being or swell up to the immense volume <sighs> of a big barrel <sighs> on which no weight could make an impression. When she would strangely expand, according to witnesses, the iron rods of her bed frame bent down to the floor as if her weight had suddenly somehow exponentially increased. What? More disturbing still, during trances of possession, when attending priests tried to open her slammed shut eyelids, they claimed to find a thick yellow skin over her eyes. Ugh. With something, quote, like a big P seen moving beneath this vile film. What the fuck? What in God's name was moving around inside of her eyes? Ugh. Emma passed still another test when it came to determining demonic possession. When she was presented with objects, secretly blessed or sprinkled with holy water, she'd fall into a rage, even foam at the mouth. When presented with objects that had not been blessed, she had no reaction. There was no visible difference between blessed and non-blessed objects. How could she tell between the two? Clarif uh, classifying the case as a true possession, Father Theo urged Emma to allow him to place her at St. Joseph Parish in Erling, Iowa, a tiny town far from Germantown, where she would be cared for by a group of Franciscan sisters. He hoped Erling's isolation would conceal her condition from others, allow him and other attendants to perform further exorcism rituals away from family and friends and their prying eyes that would likely make her the almost exclusive focus of the area's gossip and rumor mill. Emma agreed. I will come no matter how hard it will be, she wrote in a letter to Father Theo. Emma then took a train from Wisconsin to Iowa, and at some point on the trip, she exhibited behavior frightening enough to rattle the train's conductors who would never reveal the exact details of what they'd witnessed. Oh, man. Emma stared at the receiving priests as if she wanted to kill them, later confessing that's exactly what she wanted to do when she saw them. At St. Joseph Covent, Emma continued to provide proof of possession. Convent, excuse me. <laughs> she wouldn't touch any food that had already been secretly blessed, but she would happily eat, happily eat an otherwise identical serving that had not been blessed. So crazy. The woman who grew up dreaming of becoming a nun was now living in a convent, but not under the circumstances she had once envisioned. While at this convent, Emma continually fought for control of her conscious mind. Incredibly, this would be the beginning of her enduring roughly three decades of exorcisms. That's insane. These exorcisms would not be, of course, you know, continuous, but this is the longest stretch of exorcisms I've ever heard of one person enduring. One moment, Emma would be her old self. The next, she roared and bellowed and barked and mauled and moaned and shrieked. Screams echoed through the neighborhood and into locals' windows. People rushed to the convent, asking if someone was being murdered or if a pig was being slaughtered. Yeah. Crosses turned upside down in the convent and in the parish. Strange noises could be heard throughout the night. Shadows seemed to move unnaturally. At times it felt as if a portal to hell itself had been opened inside of the St. Joseph Parish. Exorcism rituals were usually carried out in a back bedroom of the convent. In various rituals, Emma's teeth would gnash and she would hurl blasphemous insults at the priests or make graphic sexual demands of them as her arms were bound to the bed frame. Father Theo would begin with the litany of all saints, evoking the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus Christ. When Theo recited the words, Lord, save your people from the persecution of the devil, an agitated voice from Emma would moan and yelp. The main initial purpose of the rituals was to determine the identity of the spirits within Emma. According to church doctrine, 
demons have to confess their names to the priest. And when the names are revealed, the priest then has power over those demons to cast them out. Father Theo detected numerous distinct voices, some deep, some raspy, some shrill, some bestial, others sounded human. Theo was intrigued when he first heard a feminine voice that was not Emma's. Initially, it had all been male voices. Is there a woman here? Father Theo asked. Yes. I command you to tell me your name, replied the priest. My name is Minnie, Minnie, <gasps> Minnie. Answering in threes common among the voices of the malicious spirits inside Emma. Are you living or dead? asked Theo, according to his detailed transcripts. I am dead, said the voice. Many again had been Emma's aunt on her mother's side, believed by the townspeople to be a witch, a woman known to have been a mistress to Emma's father, Jacob, possibly his mistress while her sister, Jacob's wife and Emma's mother, was still alive. Ugh. Father Theo began to believe that Minnie was the one who had made Emma vulnerable to possession. By interviewing Minnie's spirit, he hoped to discover the key to cleansing her from all this demonic activity. Are you damned? He asked Minnie's spirit. Yes, I am damned, she Ugh. hissed. Did you give something to this girl? The priest prodded by, we by means of which the relation of this girl to the devil was established. I have done that, the voice answered. Father Theo concluded that Minnie had poisoned and enchanted Emma in some way while she was still alive that had somehow created a type of condition in Emma's body which gave the spirits, as they interpreted it, a satanic right to enter her. For a time, Father Theo was worried that the demons inside Emma would kill her. She occasionally would stop eating entirely for days and then would get so weak she would have to be carried back and forth to the site of the exorcisms. Once it all got so bad she had to be force fed by the convent's nuns to stay alive. Father Theo tried to remain positive throughout all of this and kept his faith that God would spare her. This woman will not die, he insisted. This manifestation is only one of Satan's cunning tricks. He cannot and will not be permitted to kill her. At night, some of the priests helping with the exorcisms started to experience their own demonic torment, as did the nuns. Oh, dear. During the height of Emma's initial exorcism, several would claim to be awakened in the middle of the night by strange scratching and gnawing sounds in the walls of their rooms. They would continue to hear some of the various voices from Emma's exorcisms taunting them. Multiple observers noted that during the initial exorcisms, the demonic voices speaking through Emma were particularly hard on one priest, Father Steiger. Oh, in one session, one of the demons threatened him directly, yelling, You will suffer for this! Just wait until the end of the week! What does that mean? That Friday, Father Steiger nearly died. He had to drive several miles to visit a sick parishioner that Friday afternoon. While driving back later that evening, by his own account, a black cloud suddenly appeared around him, swallowing his car whole before it reached a nearby bridge that spanned across a deep ravine. It suddenly seemed as if Father Steiger's eyes had been blindfolded. He could see nothing outside the car. He tried to stop his car, but instead it accelerated into the darkness, smashed through a trellis, busting through the barricade, leaving the car dangling halfway out over the ravine, wobbling as if just the slightest extra bit of pressure or weight would send Father Steiger to be smashed against the ravine floor. Oh, shit. A farmer who heard the crash rushed over, steadied the car enough for the priest to crawl out. Steiger went to a doctor to get checked for injuries and then headed straight for the convent, furious with the demons inside of Emma. As he entered the room, she defiantly stared at him with a menacing grin. It was as if she expected him to walk in the room at that very moment, and a deep voice from within her laughed and yelled, Be ready for a whole lot more fun, priests. What? That's what was documented. No way. Father Steiger, shaken and legitimately afraid for his life, would take more of a background role from that point on with the exorcism proceedings and would eventually excuse himself entirely from future exorcisms. Ah, uh, yeah. Shortly after this incident, a new male voice could be heard making guttural sounds. Who are you? Asked Father Theo. I am Judas, spoke a particularly ominous voice from within Emma. Father Theo demanded to know what Judas's intentions were with Emma, and Judas told him to bring her to despair so that she will commit suicide and hang herself. She must get the rope. She must go to hell. Whew. Multiple attendants claimed to have witnessed this exchange. In between draining exorcism sessions with Father Theo, Emma would feel like her old self, and there are records of her describing what she felt during the exorcism proceedings. That's crazy. She claimed she never had any memories of what you know she said or did during these exorcisms. It's like she would get lost inside of herself, lost in what she felt uh, was hell itself. My body, she would say, feels as if it's filled with fire. 
I am enveloped in dark night as in a cloud. Very many devils are present, hissing in all directions and like flashes of lightning. I see their heads with their fiery eyes. Two gigantic serpents are above me. Emma also described a vision of a battle in which Lucifer, Beelzebub, her father Jacob directed legions of devils against St. Michael, the fight growing fiercer and fiercer. After contending with the voice who identified itself as Judas, Father Theo was also confronted with the spirit of Emma's deceased father, Jacob Schmidt, the man believed to have abused, possibly even molested his daughter, Emma. Theo asked, What do you want to do here, Jacob? The voice screamed, I want to lead my child to hell. Jesus. Theo yelled back, You are in hell, but your daughter will never, will never go to hell with you. As the intense exorcism rituals dragged on from weeks into months, Emma's case began to attract interest from Father Theo's superiors, both in the Midwest and back at the Vatican. Father Theo was now claiming that Emma was possessed by legions, a multitude of spirits, a number Theo would eventually tally as being in the millions. What? It was as if her body had become a conduit to the underworld itself. Church officials were approaching all of this, of course, with extreme caution. The administration of Pope Pius XI had severely restricted authorizations for who could perform exorcisms. Father Theo himself had already gotten into trouble for performing unauthorized exorcisms back in New York. Many within the church were finding the reports of Father Theo's interactions with Emma to be impossible to believe. None of them have heard, had heard of anything quite like this. Some suspected group hallucinations or that Father Theo, Emma, and everyone else involved were outright scamming them. Father Theo had to prove his case. He could be defrocked over this. And to the church, you know, he did prove his case, bolstering his position in regards to not making all of this up were many eyewitnesses, including Father Steiger, who went on record verifying what they had seen. Also, a Milwaukee-based physician was brought in to study Emma's trances. He concluded that whatever afflictions she was suffering from had no known medical basis. The doctor also observed and verified Emma's knowledge of many languages she had never learned. Several other witnesses also wrote affidavits uh, attesting to what they had seen, backing up many of Father Theo's accounts. Could all of this be actually true? It strained credibility. And then Emma's spiritual situation became even more incredulous. How? Suddenly through Emma... Father Theo found himself discoursing not with just, uh, just with voices claiming to be evil legions, but suddenly with divine spirits as well. Emma, or the voices speaking through Emma, started to deliver speeches and preach sermons that far surpassed any theological understanding that one could reasonably expect from a layperson. Multiple priests, in addition to Father Theo, began studying Emma and concluded that her historical, theological, and scriptural knowledge could not have been acquired naturally, given her background and education. Father Theo and many others in the church began to consider Emma to be a Christian oracle of sorts. What? A powerful vehicle through which spirits can be communicated with both good and evil. This is insane. And one of the prophecies professed by one of the good spirits through Emma is believed by some to have saved Pope Pius's life back in the Vatican. Roughly two decades after Father Theo's first exorcism, on July 16, 1931, around 7.30 p.m., the unimaginable happened. A tin box was found in a dark corner near the tomb of Pope Clement XIII in St. Peter's Cathedral, where the Pope would often hold mass. Inside of this box was a powerful bomb, designed to explode when touched. But it was defective. Had it exploded when intended, it would have killed Pope Pius. Back in Wisconsin, on the day of the explosion, Father Theo had transcribed a message of Emma triumphantly, that Emma triumphantly relayed from the Virgin Mary about saving the Pope. It said, My servant, your confessor, gives me joy, and I am pleased with his work, namely that for my honor, the welfare of the church, and the salvation of souls, so many devils have been cast into hell. It was high time for these devils helped to it was high time for these devils helped to lay the bomb to destroy Rome and kill the Holy Father. Had the devils not been bound before and cast into hell, the bomb would have not been found. Did Father Theo's spiritual work with Emma somehow keep demons from killing the Pope in Rome? I mean, how is that possible? It's what some within the church would come to believe. Despite the presence of good spirits, now believed to be communicating through Emma, the demons were still far from done with her. Nearly 30 years after her first Roman ritual with Father Theo, Emma would travel back to Iowa, undergo her worst period of possession, she would nearly die. Emma endured such physical difficulty during the final series of exorcisms that she was given last rites by the nuns in attendance. Oh dear. She was described during the final exorcism's climax as having a pale, death-like, and emaciated head, as red as glowing embers. Her eyes, lips, and body appeared so bloated 
that the nuns reportedly backed away in fear that the possessed woman could somehow burst into pieces. Ugh. Father Theo cast out countless demons over a period of a few months, one after another after another. The voice of one devil is reported to have complained that hell cannot afford to send more devils for the fight. Theo reported that another demon personally begged for the exorcisms to end. The, Theo had his sights on expelling Lucifer himself. He wanted to finally free Emma once and for all. Legend has it that this last exorcism came down to an ultimate confrontation between Father Theo and the devil. The small convent room was packed with nuns and assistants. An assistant stood by to wipe perspiration from Theo's face and forehead, which pooled down in rivulets onto the floor. He had to take breaks to change his soaked habit. Out-of-body visions were not limited to just Emma in this final showdown. Father Theo later described seeing the room suddenly burst into flames. He saw Lucifer himself, a crown on his head, holding a sword of fire approaching him. Lucifer seemed to take the measure of the priest as they stared each other down. What could you do? The evil incarnate of Theo's visions asked. If you were bound as I am. When Theo ordered Lucifer back to hell, the voice coming from Emma complained, Does he not know I must prepare the way for the Antichrist? How then can he banish me unto hell? Theo's notes claim that as countless demonic spirits exited, witnesses actually saw shadowy spirits leave her body. They went through the hands, as a rule, also through the feet. The spirits begged the exorcist not to force them to leave. Observers described Emma's arms dislodging from their bindings Ugh. and away from the attendants' attempts to hold her down. Voices from within her cried out, Beelzebub, Judas, Jacob, mini hell, 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 with the worst of the spirits banished. Emma's body impossibly lifted up on its own to nearly a standing position, arms out like Jesus on the cross. In a flash, her body was reported to be carried through the air by unseen forces. It was as if she were floating, and she floated up against a wall above the door. Priests and nuns present, present grabbed her body and pulled her back down towards her bed. She sank with an exhale of relief and then lost consciousness. She would wake up in an hour and exclaim, Oh Jesus, dearest Jesus, I am free. Oh Jesus, I love you. It's over? Emma smiled brightly. It seemed like for the first time she had smiled in ages. The group in the room with Emma erupted into sobs and cheers and prayers. Our joy was exceedingly great, Father Theo later wrote. We thank God for our victory over hell. A short time later, Emma left the convent and went on to live a quiet, private life in Iowa, free from torment. She never married, never had children. She lived until the age of 82, long surviving the many punishing years of continual exorcisms. Her story remains one of the most heavily documented accounts of demonic possession in U.S. history. I literally kept thinking this can't be real. I mean, I mean, I really the same could be said for any of these stories. I know, that but one like... is especially crazy. That one is especially crazy. I mean, you know, all I just, this. I'm doing some cleansing spray. There is. I mean, Time Magazine even wrote about this. Really? Yeah. I mean, way back in the 30s. But yeah, heavily, heavily documented. You know, multiple witnesses claim to have seen. All of those things happen uh, and more. That was, you know, somewhat condensed. I mean, I never put my cross down. I just, I've never, ever, ever, ever heard of a dual possession. Me either. Me either. That, never, that's ever. That's when I was like, uh-uh, no way. And, and, and of course, you know, to be to be clear to like new uh, listeners, you know, we know that with uh, demonic possessions in particular, there is always going to be the two sides. There's going to be the theological side and there's going to be the psychological side. Right. And on the psychological side, you know, people will claim mental illness every time. And, and I'm not saying that that isn't uh, the case uh, in all of these. I don't know. But again, like I say, like, just if just one of them isn't, you know, there there are many people out there. I guess I should say who believe very strongly that it it is not psychological. And and to the present day, there are people who have more psychological knowledge than they used to. Right. Who right. still encounter people who are familiar with paranoid schizophrenia, for example. Sure. Other schizotypal kind of disorders. Yeah. And don't think it fits into one of those categories when they see somebody possessed. Uh, and, and I do have uh, before we get into questions, a picture just to set like I, I, of the of the area, like the convent. Okay. This first picture is of that uh, little convent that still exists. I believe the building is still there, at least in that little tiny town of Erling, Iowa. And then the next picture is of the church in Erling. That's beautiful. It is a pretty church. Yeah. Yeah. And I had a hard time getting good resolution photos from inside of it, but it's really pretty inside. And this is like a tiny, that's like a rigged, like a, a few hundred people sized town. Okay. They okay. Have a, they have a really prominent Catholic presence for such a small town. Sure. Uh, this next picture is Father Theo. Okay. But he, in his later years. He looks like any normal priest. Looks like, a, to me, like an intense exorcism dealing out dude. Yeah. Uh, this next picture is uh, the only one I could find of Emma herself. 
So that's a young Emma. And then again, like normal, fine. Right, right. And then the, the story gets told is uh, sometimes the, the, her pseudonym is Anna Eklund, which is a pseudonym for Emma. Looking under Anna, I did find another picture. Uh, <sighs> <laughs> that is not from that. It, it actually it, it is from the movie The Exorcism of Anna Eklund. It came out in 2016, uh, straight to right, video. That's why it looks like. <sighs> you don't like to look at that one? No. That's ba- that's a picture based on her. I don't care. You don't want to keep looking at it? No, I said. <laughs> okay. Joe, God damn it. Okay, it's gone. It's gone. I can't look over there because I don't trust Joe not to just randomly throw it back up. So, I mean, I, I wondered as Ugh, I was going through this. That was a this, really like. It's intense, right? Yeah, it was, it was long. It was yeah. intense. Like, I was like, okay, there can't be more. There can't be more. There can't be more. I felt a little lightheaded in a few moments. Like, uh, Do you know, I, you know what got me the most in that one? What? The little thing moving in her eyeball. Ugh. I was just, I was thinking about her belly. Yeah, the yeah. weird, it distended, and the weight. I mean, so many strange phenomena that supposedly, you know, was witnessed. Well, that's the thing that gets me. Like, when you say, like, is it a uh, mental illness right. or is it not? And it's like, I just don't know how you get a room full of people right. to agree on that story. Because to me, if, like, if that priest is doing an exorcism and is documenting it and saying it's all real, it's all true, right. and then publishes it, let's say. I mean, I don't know if that's the right word, yeah. but shares this information other people would come forward and be like, dude, that didn't happen. I mean, You're I, claiming I yeah. was there and I wasn't. Like, right. So I just feel like. I will acknowledge that people can get whipped, worked up together. Yes. And, and, and that people can feel pressure to conform. That's a real psychological phenomenon. Like, right. like you know, maybe their superior publishes something. They don't want to go against it. Right. And they're like, uh, yeah, 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 sure. I mean, th- again, that can happen with any of these. But like I always say, I mean, what if that happened? But there was I just wasn't there. so. Yeah. And it, there was a lot of people involved. Yeah. That weird thing about like just wait till Friday or whatever. Ugh, that felt yeah, so Steiger. specific. I mean, obviously it was, but it just felt like, and, and it goes both ways. Where I'm like, mm. no fucking way, no demon is calling out wait till Friday. But then also, right. why not? I know that's that's the thing with all these that I go back and forth with too. Because like during the day when I'm more skeptical, totally, I'd be like, come on, it's not gonna, it's not gonna talk like that. But then at night I'm like, how would you know how a demon talks? Right. Like, what, Have you what? talked to any recently? <laughs> I don't know how they're supposed to talk. Like, I, I don't think our kids are possessed, so. <laughs> I mean, they are buttheads, but did I don't you, think they're demons. Did you ever hear about, I mean, possessions growing up Catholic oh. in Cleveland, like in, like in your parish? No, never. Okay. I mean, and I know it varies quite a bit from church to church. Right. I know that some Catholics are not into it. Some orders are oh. not into it. Uh, there, there's a fair amount of disagreement within the church about like the validity of exorcisms kind of in general. But, yeah. but there are, are still many uh, priests, you know, who very much believe in them. Yeah. I, I just know that um, when I watched Stigmata, the movie, yeah. I was so freaked out. So I, And I must have been so freaked out because I must have at that point, I mean, I was like maybe sixth, seventh grade. I must have heard about exorcisms in church because like why would it hit me so hard right Right. so i must have had some personal association with it in my upbringing and i did go to the (laughs) i remember just telling my mom like i wanted to see our priest the next day oh yeah yeah we were really close to him he was a a great pastor father dave loved him and i mean i loved him like also you know i grew up in that church that was the church connected to my school we went to church all the time like it was a huge part of my life so i found a great deal of comfort and i was like father dave Right, right. This shit is scary. Yeah. And yeah. I don't even remember what he told me. I'm sure he told me something comforting, but it never led to, oh, yeah, well, it oh, could happen. Right, right, or, right, right. This is what we believe, you know, none of that. It is. I was thinking about, uh, you know, exorcisms where um, on Time Suck, another podcast, I did that Annalise Michelle oh. uh, story. Do you know, I've still never listened to that one. Yeah. I like, I've tried and I can't yeah. because there were so many updates about people having so many That's problems. That's what I was going to say. I still, still to this day, even, still to this day, even in Michigan, just a couple of days ago, uh, somebody mentioned that somebody, you know, told me in the little meet and greet oh, after God, the show, they're like, they're like, my phone froze up at ex- like the same moment that it froze up That's for so thing. many other people during the sounds of that were supposedly recorded of her uh, possession. Yeah. So there's something, uh, it's something weird about all that for sure. How have you been doing? Before we get into yeah. our fan stories, how have you been doing with the stories? Like, I know we always talk about, like, how's Lindsay doing? And I appreciate that you guys are worried about mm-hmm. me. And I just want to say, actually, this past week, You're I, good. I was great until I started reading fan stories last, last night. night. I don't want to give anything away. Um, yeah. Because as soon as I start reading this, you'll be like, oh, okay, got it. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I've been doing pretty good. I mean, the that that doll, you know, Harold. Uh, or the one behind you. <laughs> yeah, that one doesn't bother me for some reason. He doesn't feel spooky. No, he doesn't feel spooky. I mean, spo- I mean looks creepy. Like, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, like I, I would just flash on it randomly and give myself the chills. Okay. I mean, okay. I mean, n- nothing crazy. Uh, one night since we recorded last time here in the studio, it was... Oh, when was it? It was when we write. Oh, it was Monday. I guess. I guess it was yesterday. Yeah, we just got back. So yeah. it was yesterday. Just yesterday, I did have uh, a moment where I got a little freaked out. I was going to come in this room and work on the stories for today. Yeah. And I was like, all of a sudden, just had like a little feeling of like, nope. Oh, that's new. So, so I just a little residual, like e, a little residual mm-hmm. heebie-jeebies. Mm-hmm. That's all. Well, I did have Reiki performed again. <laughs> oh yeah. Stop laughing at me. I'm going to make you do it. Okay. And then you'll see, you'll understand. The good news is, for all of my fellow Reiki lovers, (laughs) uh, it went really well, and it was actually really cleansing, and I feel more positive and uplifted. And if you know anything about the chakras and how Reiki works, uh, over my heart chakra, my energy healer saw a a yellow flower blossoming over and over again, which is a really good sign of being in touch with the universe and being steady and even. And then she kept seeing um, a specific angel appear that also was very good. And um, yeah, she was able to balance out my chakras. And I, I hear myself. I know that it sounds a little like, okay, but it's pretty amazing how you feel afterwards. I have to say. I stopped listening when when you said you saw a flower. (laughs) I just waited for it to be over. Why are you such an <laughs> asshole? I know. I, I'll see. I'll, you know what? I know. I'm skeptical, but but the show. I'm gonna set it up for you over over the Christmas break. You have a little break from touring from stand up, and I'm gonna have you go. And it's it's. I get it because if I hadn't experienced it, and someone was telling me this, I'd be like, okay, sure. But every time, like my arms literally feel like they're on fire. Like you can't, you can't fake that. I can't. And for it to happen two times in a row, and this time was different than the first time, so it's not like, yeah. and she's not touching me. And and we laugh about it, too. Like, I was telling her, I'm like, you should wear a GoPro camera on your head, because you probably look like a fucking lunatic when you're doing this. Because there's a lot of, like, yeah. hand motion, wax on, wax off kind of looking stuff. So, you know, at least the person that I'm going to has humility and yeah. and some some laughter about it. Cause yeah, like, yeah, 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 true. I think that anybody with anything, when you go so hard in one direction, it's too much. Right, right. So, yeah, I'm open to seeing uh, what, it, what it is. Yeah, for sure. Do you want to hear about the creepy thing that happened today? Yeah, on your phone? Yeah. Um, so I use voice text a lot, right? Like I'm getting mm-hmm. ready, whatever. I've got a lot going on. And I was texting one of my friends this morning about something and I stopped talking and I didn't hit the button for it to stop recording. Yeah. And then word step st- st- started, st- kept going. <laughs> Ooh, what were the words saying? Well, that was the weird thing. It said, catch me, catch me, catchy, catchy, catch me, catch me. And I was like, that is so random. That That's creepy. Okay. And then I was texting Kyler. You were taking him to school and I needed to remind him about something. Yeah. And I stopped talking and it, because I did it on purpose. I'm like, okay. I was curling my hair and the curling iron cord was like hitting against the cabinet. So I thought like, I don't know how that noise would yeah. cause words. That is crazy. Yeah. But then again, with Kyler's, I stopped talking. It went catchy, 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 catchy. Weird. And I was the like. Catch stuff. Yeah. God, I, for, I, for, I, that weird? that is weird. Is there a spirit that wants to be. Well, I don't know. I, I wasn't thinking it was actually catch. I was thinking Kathy. Is there a Kathy in our house? weird i don't know i don't know any kathy's except for kathy tucker from the sixth grade who i don't know anymore (laughs) (laughs) that just reminded me i totally forgot i keep getting messages like from myself it's a weird thing are you being serious right now and the messages it keeps saying joe and his family will be taken (laughs) into the pits of hell (laughs) producer joe and his family will be taken to the pits of hell and then it'll be like a little dash and it'll be signed satan (laughs) i I forgot to mention that to joe (laughs) i thought you were gonna say something (laughs) like my wife will give me more blowjobs. <laughs> oh, ha. Ah, ah, I could have went in that direction. Oh, man. man. I just I just assumed that's know. where you would take it. Are okay, you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, do you have your squishy? Yeah, I got my little stress doll. I'm going to have a little uh, sip. Okay. You have your little sip. I'll prepare for fan sent in horror stories. I'm starving, which is why I was chugging drinks this morning. <laughs> I'm so hungry. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Now, I know last week was incredibly creepy. Mm-hmm. And these are creepy as well, but a different kind of creepy. Okay. Um, I didn't really want to tell these stories because both of them take place really close to our house. Fun. So that's fun. And that's mm-hmm. why I was super freaked out. 
Hey, Dan and Lindsay, this is one of many strange occurrences that have happened to my family when we were living out in the woods. About three or four years ago, my wife and I and our young son lived on a five forest, forested acre parcel up a dirt road off of Garwood. I know you said you don't want to hear about anything creepy happening in Coeur d'Alene, Lindsay, which is why I had to send in my story. Thanks. <laughs> For those of you who don't know Garwood, it's only a few miles north of Hayden, which is basically part of Coeur d'Alene. So it's just north okay. of where we are. I know exactly where it is and I'm already creeped out. I was born in Coeur d'Alene and my wife is from Spokane. Actually, you know my wife's sister, Brittany, and her man, Cameron, who recently gave you a neon ba- banana sign. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we do know them. Anyways, the house is about half a mile up a dirt road and the woods get pretty thick out there. But the thir- first 30 or 40 feet into the backyard only had about five large trees. One night, we were lying in bed watching TV, and for whatever reason, the blinds were up and the curtains were open. As I'm sure you know, having the windows open with lights on inside and darkness outside is one of the most uncomfortable and creepy feelings one can have, especially when outside there is only a deep, dark forest. Mm -hmm. I can't remember if it was me or my wife who noticed it first, but one of us looked out the window, which was literally right next to our bed and saw a very tall, skinny, humanoid shape standing next to the nearest tree to the window, 20 feet away at most. The moon was out and it was bright enough to make it clearly, although we couldn't see any features like an eyes or mouth. It was facing our direction and it had two skinny legs, two skinny arms, a bulbous head, and what I would guess was about six or seven feet tall. It looked exactly like what you would think a gray alien would look like. I swear to God, it just stood there staring at us until we closed the blinds. We made sure all the windows and doors were locked, and for the rest of the night, we just talked about what the hell we may have just seen. Oh my God. The next day, I woke up. I immediately looked out the window to see if in the daylight, it would show me something that our minds were just playing a trick on us. Right where the thing was standing the night before, there was absolutely nothing. By the way... This was not the last time we saw this creature while living out there, but that's a different story. About a week later, the family who had lived in the house prior to us came by for a visit randomly. Their six-year-old son had told us, uh, the six-year-old son had told us that our bedroom used to be his bedroom. And what he said next was a shock to both of us. He asked if we had seen the alien yet that comes out at night and stands next to the tree and looks into the window from the backyard. Our freaking jaws dropped as my wife and I looked at each other. Anyway, we lived out there for about two years and have experienced a few strange things, a couple of which scared the shit out of us. But now we're back living in town. We both actually really love living in the woods and would still prefer to live out of town, but maybe in a different spot. Yeah. Keep up the great work. You guys kick ass. I'm a long time time sucker and both shows are fantastic. I hope to visit the Suck Dungeon one of these days. Cameron. Wow. Right? Yeah. Uh, especially to hear that from that little kid. Uh huh. Like, what the hell is out in those woods? Do you think about how our bedroom's set up? That's mm-hmm. what I thought about. Mm-hmm. Our our bed sits the head of the bed sits against a wall like this, and if you could imagine, like this mic arm and that mic arm are windows, and our bed is in the middle. So the windows are like just a little bit above the the height of the bed. But every yeah. night for the past couple of weeks now, the dogs middle of the night are getting up and freaking out. Now. Generally, there's a deer. Yeah. But how could they? The the windows are frosted. You can't see out. You can't see in. They smell them. The curtains are drawn. Is it a deer? I that think, really I, makes I, them want to go out there? I think so. I think I think it's a deer. But but I mean, yeah, but that's the thing. I mean, it clearly wasn't a, a deer in the situation, what they were seeing. Uh-huh. Yeah, and, and, and it's that thing of like, yeah, what if 99 times out of 100 is a deer? What if that one other time it's some weird, creepy creature Do that have- we can't explain? Do you ever wonder if there's possibly a transient living in our um, treehouse? Dan built this amazing treehouse no, that's I've in never, our backyard. I've, I've never thought that. Oh, I think that every time I have to let the dogs out, when you stand at the back of our house and you look out yeah. to, to the left, we have this tree fort. It's like, what, 10 feet up off the ground? Yeah. And I mean, it's it's a it's a tiny little house. Yeah. And the door is painted black with like that chalk paint. Mm. And so it just looks like a an abyss in the evenings. Like, oh, it just right, looks like dark right. hole. And I swear to God, I constantly wonder, like, what if that door just opened right now? Oh, my God. What if someone just popped out? I never thought of that, but now I will. You're welcome. (laughs) 
I mean, if I was homeless and I, I saw would, that, yeah. I'd be like, fuck yeah. That place has carpet, beanbag chairs. There's probably some scraps of food well, the kids have left up there. Don't get any ideas if you're in the area, because if I find you, it's not going to be good hanging out in my kid's free house. Well, the door is always locked, and right. we have guns. Yeah. <laughs> and no one knows where we live. True, 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 true. Lunatic. Okay. Are you ready for one more story? I am. I mean, since we were already in our backyards, okay. I just thought... Let's just keep it there. Run with it. Yeah, let's let's just go with a little theme this week. So this story comes from Rathdrum, which is just about 15, 20 minutes, again, from the Coeur d'Alene area. Mm -hmm. Not far at all. This fan writes in, let me just start by saying I'm a huge fan of the show. I love what you guys are doing. I've turned so many people onto it already. Yes. Yes. Thank you. My coworkers and I listen together every Wednesday morning. A couple weeks Uh. ago, Lindsay mentioned that Dan was going to tell a story from the Coeur d'Alene, Idaho area, and well, I'm a resident of Kootenai County, and I do have a true scary story that takes place in Coeur d'Alene, in the Coeur d'Alene area. I'm excited to share this with you guys. I think this is good. So about four years ago, we threw a huge horror-themed surprise party for my niece, who was turning 18. We had fake body parts all over the food, a zombie shooting game, and a DJ playing horror music. Cool. Yeah. The whole thing ended with one last surprise, a Slender Man scavenger hunt in my brother's <laughs> four-acre backfield where the teenagers would go out after dark and hunt for the eight Slenderman pages that I had made and placed on the property oh, myself. So like, so like illustrations of Slender Man probably. You know, there, um, yeah, just to like, so that the rest of the story makes sense, there is a... Sorry, I was telling you guys, there's a game yeah. of Slender Man, you have to collect the pages. Exactly. Oh, got it. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Thank you, Joe. I was prepared to explain that. (laughs) But yeah, okay. okay. I jumped the gun. I jumped it. it, Just like Dan. Just because. I'm so sorry. But yes, but that's all I know. Okay. 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 So I don't know what the page is. I don't know if they're images, but you just, you collect these things and in the game, it, um, you have a certain amount of time to find them. And if you don't find them, you die and then you start over. And then if if you collect all eight, then you get to like walk around the game for a little bit without Slender Man. So they're doing the real life version of this. Exactly. They're bringing to life. Yeah. So, you know. Don't get any ideas. We're not doing real life Red Dead Redemption. (laughs) Okay. None of the kids knew in advance that we were going to be playing this game. But when they found out, they were all excited. My two brothers, who are both very tall, were dressed as Slendermen. They had the faceless masks and everything. They walked around the field, stalking and scaring the kids while they looked around, while the kids looked around parked cars and other objects we had laid out there for to hide the pages. My sister-in-law and I were watching from the sidelines for a while. Everything was going fine until my sister-in-law said she saw someone running out behind their house, which was separated from the scavenger hunt by a fence. I joked with her about having too much wine, but she was done after that. She didn't want to be out there anymore, and she went to bed. Everything seemed to go on without a hitch, and the next morning I dropped by the shop to help my brothers clean up the mess, and that's when I found out things didn't go quite as well as we had expected. My brother had asked me who else was dressed up in that black outfit during the night during the hunt. The reason they asked was that they each saw another Slenderman in the field. Oh my God. So I messaged one of the teenagers asking how many Slendermen were at the party. Guys, I was expecting her to write back too because there were only two. My brothers, she wrote back four. Four? Later, the kids would tell us that the two extra Slender Men were chasing them around all night or hiding next to them, terrorizing them. None of them mentioned it because they all thought it was part of the game. They didn't know that my brothers were chasing after the other two Slender Men as well. But every time they'd get close, the two extra Slender Men would dive into the grass and would seem to just disappear. That night, my nephew also claimed to have seen someone in his room. My sister-in-law managed to convince him that what he saw was a combination of toys in his room and just a bad nightmare. But my brother, who goes around the house every night and checks all the doors and windows to make sure things are locked tight, couldn't help but notice that his son's bedroom window was wide open the morning after the party. Oh my God. We asked around for a while, hoping we could find an answer. At first we thought maybe some of the kids were just screwing around, but no one else knew that we were going to be playing this game except my brothers and I. Whoever was back there terrorizing everyone also had the Slender Men mask on because they had no face. It's been nearly four years and we have still never figured out who was back there when they shouldn't have been. And that is my true story out of Kootenai County. 
Thank you both for doing the show. I love it so much. Lindsay, stay brave and keep it going. You guys are one of the highlights of my week, and I want to see the show continue for years to come. <laughs> Wishing nothing but the best for you both. After all, who doesn't love being scared to death? Signed, a fellow creep, A. <laughs> oh, thank you, man. That one gave me the chills. Right? Yeah, that would, oh man, that would stick in my head. I would just reflect on that off and on. I mean, continually. I was thinking that like, I could probably only play oh, that game when man. I was young and 18 and like loved horror things, you know, because right. I don't know, the older you get, it's just like how when you're younger, you're fearless in the sure, sense that sure, like, sure, sure. you'll go snowboarding, you go skateboard, like you'll do other things. And now you're like, ah, oh, shit, I don't want to miss time off work. What's the insurance yeah. bill going to be? And you're also just, um, you're more conscious of your mortality. I think as you get older, exactly. You actually physically become more uptight about those kinds of things mm -hmm. where you're like, meh, I'm good. So, like, that seems like exactly the kind of game a bunch of 18-year-olds would play. But in my mind, I was like, why, why would you do that? Why would you go out there? I wouldn't do that. I would just be like, no, I'm good. I'm good. And then I'd watch everybody else be fucking freaked out. <laughs> yeah, I just keep thinking. I mean, I would, I would be just harassing people. Like, are you sure that you weren't dressed up? You know, are you oh, yeah. sure you didn't tell a friend? Would you line up all the kids? But that's the I thing know. he said, that the I kids know. didn't know, know ahead of the party. Right, right, right. So I would think it was like my brothers or something. Right. But if they're constantly saying, but I mean, oh my Four God. Four years. Like, would you be able to hold on to a joke for that long? I don't know. Probably not. No way. I would feel bad because I would feel like someone's probably not sleeping. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And I would want to give in to them to help them feel some sort of peace and whatever. And again, just, just the thought of like, what if that is Eek. true? What if some entities were like, here's our chance to sneak around. Well, that's the and thing. be part of the fun. That's what I'm thinking. I'm already flashing back to the black eyed children. It's oh like, gosh, what was yeah. what was that about? Like you have to be invited in? I don't, yeah, exactly. That's that's that's, that's what they say. Uh, basically every black eyed children's story I've come across, and there's quite a few, it's it's all based around like this concept of yeah, being invited. They all want to be either let in, I mean, again, usually a vehicle or a house, but they want to be let into your space. Mm -mm. And yeah, I don't know. Who knows why? Uh, I keep thinking about that first story. I'm like, why? Why did they want to be taken to that house? Like, what it was going on in that? Right. Oh, just so weird. So weird. Maybe, All of it's so weird. Maybe somebody died at that house. Maybe, or maybe they were trying to get the people there so they could harass them further. Well, there's people. There's people who believe within in this world of the paranormal yeah. that there are places where the the barrier is substantially thinner between this world and others. What do they say about Coeur d'Alene, Idaho? I've never heard anything about Coeur d'Alene being is some that where, supposed vortex or portal. Is that where the barrier's the thickest? Is that why we're I'm, here? I'm going to say it's pretty thick. I'm, I'm, I'm going to hope it's nice and thick. Please. I like thick borders and I cannot lie. <laughs> I mean, but seriously. Yeah. That, that's all I think about. Like this, I know I'm going to be fucked up. I'm going to be fucked oh, up driving great. to your mom's. When we drive like Dan's mom lives here mm -hmm. in the middle of fucking nowhere. Mm -hmm. And then his grandparents also live here. More also in the middle of nowhere, like in a little town. Yep. Right. So if you're familiar with Riggins, Idaho, can you imagine driving uh, towards Riggins? Like it's so dark in that canyon at night. What are you talking about? Of and, course, that's what I'm. That's exactly right, what I was right, going to mention. Right, and then, but I was going to say, and then you see in the headlights up above, two little kids, dark eyes, standing oh. on the side of the road. I would turn around. I would stop the fucking car and turn back around. Oh, I would just drive through them. I would just I keep wouldn't. going. No, think about how narrow that road is. You can't just turn around and you can't drive backwards. You have to keep going. Oh, See, this is why you got to listen to 99% of the women. Oh, we say get the fuck out. Oh. Just drive on. Why would you turn around? How are you going to turn around on that road? Think slam about it. Slam on the brakes. Maybe, think, maybe that's how you slam on the brakes though. And then you hit a patch of ice and then you go off into the river. And then you die. Hypothermia. And right. And there's people that go into the river every single year on that little stretch of highway and die. And who said to just keep going? This one. <laughs> That's the thing. Think about how narrow that road I know, is. I know, I know. There's not enough room to turn around. And it's like a, I don't know, would you call it a highway? It is a highway. Cause, yeah, because I mean, you can go so, I was thinking about the speed limit. It's oh not, yeah, it's, it's not like you're on like 95. A, yeah. Right, it's not like you're like on 35 and, you no, know. No, you're going 65, 70. Right, so if you think you're going to turn around, that's insane because another car can come and it is so dark and there are no street lights. And sometimes there's a deer and you do see beady little eyes. Oh God, we should probably stay home for Thanksgiving. What if the black eyed children, I, I wouldn't be as f afraid if I saw two black eyed children, but they were each riding a deer like a horse. <laughs> <laughs> like a unicorn. <laughs> then I'd be like, okay, Bow. they seem all right. Those ones don't seem scary. Those are the good ones. Those are the good black eyed children. Those are the good ones. Those are the funny ones. 
Those are the protectors? Oh, man. I don't know. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Are you excited for Thanksgiving? I am excited for Thanksgiving. A lot to be thankful for. I should, uh, you know, just really quick, just like we are thankful for so much yeah. this year with uh, Time Suck and Scared to Death, the people spreading these shows around, letting us do this as a as a job professionally, making us, you know, want to work harder. And then now that we've, you know, been working hard on these for a while, getting to spend more time with the family. Um, and just, yeah, f- having this feel more secure. Very, very, very thankful. So I, I hope you all, creeps and peepers, have a very happy Thanksgiving. And I hope I'm excited you- to spend it with you. That's nice. Yep. Who yep. else would you spend it with? I don't know. Some of my, I got some side action. Good for you. Is she hot? Yeah. I want to see pictures. She's, a, she's in Canada. It's my Canadian girlfriend. You can't go to Canada. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Does she smuggle you in? Don't, don't ask me too many questions. I don't want to get, I don't, I don't know. What? What's her name? I don't know. Is she blonde or brunette? She has Canadian hair. <laughs> okay, let's oh, let's get out of here. It's this all- is our life. This is our life. This is this is Dan and Lindsay in real time. Please keep sending your stories, your scary stories, to my story at scared to death podcast.com. For all other stories, info at scared to death scared to death podcast.com. Correct. You can follow us uh Facebook, Instagram at scared to death podcast. Uh thank you for listening or watching uh Bad Magic Production. Thanks to the Bad Magic Productions team. Harmony Vellacamp on social media. Joe Paisley producing and directing. Zach Flannery helping out as well. Thanks to Joe Paisley, Zach Cohen, Jeffrey Montoya for the sound beds, and Heather Rylander for taking over the My Story at Scared to Death podcast.com messages. And uh, yeah, subscribe, like, share, talk about, enjoy your nightmares, creeps and peepers. Have a great Thanksgiving and be scared to death. See ya. If spirits threaten me in this place, Fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but has no home here within scared to death.